It's great to be able to speak to you today, church. And uh, I want to I want to speak to you on something that is dear to my heart, and I believe that it's dear to God's heart as well. And that is the grace of God. In uh, in Second Chronicles chapter thirty three, there is a a powerful story there because there is a king, and he's the king of Judah, and uh, scripture describes him as probably one of the most evil kings in the history of Judah and in the history of Israel. Uh, you can read his story, but King Manasseh was his name. And, uh, and the, the passage tells us that he became so evil that he led the whole nation into idol worship. They, he, he began to, to seek out divination instead of seeking out God as the kings before him did. He sought witchcraft to lead the nation. Uh, he, he began to worship the Baals and he set up temples all around the nation for Baal worship. And if you knew Baal worship in that time, it says that they sacrificed their children in the fire. So they literally, uh, Baal was a fertility god. And, uh, and for them to think for prosperity to come upon the nation, for the rain to come and for the, for the crops to produce as harvest, Baal was the, the, the demonic God they worshipped. And so they would sacrifice their children to please Baal. This is how crazy this king had become. This is how evil this king had become. And he led the whole nation of Judah into this idol worship and into these perverted ways. And if you keep reading his story, uh, he gets taken out into exile by another king, another army. And we would say, well, God, take him out. Come on, God, this, this guy, just get rid of him, Lord. He, he deserves judgment, right? But it says in the passage that King Manasseh, he sought the favour of God. He repented and he sought the favour of God. I mean, how dare he, right? How dare a king like that seek the favour of God, but he did. And what did God do? God didn't judge him. God, God didn't bring down His wrath upon King Manasseh, but it says that the Lord was moved by His prayer. Come on, that is the grace of God today. God's grace is one of the most powerful forces upon the earth. Do you know that God's grace is one of the greatest weapons against the devil? Come on, King Manasseh, an evil king, he sought the favour of God. He realised he was wrong, sought the Lord's favour and prayed to God. And the Scripture says that God was moved by this man's prayer and God restored him to, to be king of Judah and King Manasseh began to rebuild the nation for God's glory. I wanna to talk to you today on the power of God's grace. God's grace is one of the greatest forces upon the earth. God's grace is the force that transforms our life. It is God's grace. It's not His judgment upon the individual. It's not His judgment upon a nation. It is God's grace. It, it, it is His tender loving kindness and mercy. It is, it is the goodness of God that is released upon individuals and nations that leads nations into the glory of the Lord. Come on. It is God's grace that transforms lives. In Romans chapter 5, verse 17, it says that, For if through the trespass of one man, death came to all men. So that's talking about Adam. If through the sin of one man, death and sin came into all the earth, right? Then how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace, amen, and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Christ Jesus. There is no comparison between the grace of God and the work of the devil. Come on. There is no comparison between the grace of God and sin in your life. Amen. There is no comparison. How much more will we reign in life when we receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness? Amen. Grace is God's greatest weapon. Grace is the greatest transforming power in our lives. You know, that Scripture tells me that if there is any area in my life, in your life, where you are not reigning, where you are not living in victory, so it could be, it could be maybe you're stuck in an addiction today. 
It could be maybe today you're getting attacked by a sickness. It could be that maybe you're living in condemnation or fear or unbelief or anxiety. Do you know what you need to do? You don't just need to do a five-step course to get better. (laughs) Come on. You, You don't need to jump through all these hoops. You don't need to just be better or live better or just think better throughout the day. Do you know what you need to do to reign in life? You need to receive the Lord's grace today. Come on. It is through grace, church. It is through grace. Grace is the foundation to reign in life. So if there is any area of my life that I look at and I think I'm not reigning, the first thing I do is I say, Jesus, I receive Your grace your unearned, undeserved, unmerited favour, kindness and blessing and goodness in my life today. Come on. Amen. This is going to get rid of some religious thinking in people's lives today. I'm believing that today as I preach on grace and I'm going to share some stories with you and it's going to shift your paradigm. As I share these Scriptures, it is going to shift people's paradigm today on the incredible goodness of God, on the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and on His finished work on the cross for us. Too many people, I believe, too many people live with a mixture of law and grace. And when I talk about law, we don't necessarily apply the, the law of the old covenant to our lives, but the heart of the, or the, 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 the the thought behind the law of the old covenant was it was all performance based. It was all about you. It was me, me, me. The law is you have to do, do, do. It is. But you know what grace is? Grace is all about God. Grace is all about Jesus. It's everything that God has done, done, done in our lives. Come on. And so we can live in this mixture of law and grace. And I wanna help people today to learn to reign in life. Amen. It's all through grace. You know, in Luke chapter 9, verse, uh, verse 51 to 55, there's a really interesting passage here. Uh, the disciples, James and John, they're with Jesus and they come to a town in Samaria. Uh, they come to Samaria at the border. And James and John have experienced the incredible grace of Jesus. They've experienced His goodness. They've seen Him, they've seen him heal people. They've seen Him uh, raise people uh, from the dead. Uh, they've, seen him, uh, he, they've seen Him have dinner with sinners and, and, and they've seen Him uh, uh, go to weddings and they've seen the authenticity and the grace and the incredible love of our Saviour. Yet they come to this town and the town reject Jesus, right? And so if someone rejected Jesus as, as, as James and John felt, you, you would feel quite hurt. But James and John don't express the grace of God to this town. What do they do? They say, Lord, do you want us to call down fire to burn these people up? Do you know, they were thinking of Elijah, the story of Elijah when he called down fire to burn up the armies that were coming, the the soldiers that would come up against him. That was the ministry of Elijah. And they thought, we're pretty smart. We've got authority from God. So let's release judgment upon this town. Lord, let's burn them up, right? And Jesus had a different idea. Jesus, what did He do? The Scripture says He rebuked them and He said to them, you do not know what spirit you are of. For the Son of Man, listen to this, the Son of Man did not come to destroy lives, but He came to save lives. Come on, that is our loving Saviour today. When we think we deserve judgment, He brings salvation. When you think you deserve discipline, He gives you a kiss. Come on, that is Jesus today. Some people, you need to shift your paradigm on the grace and the goodness of our Lord Jesus Christ and of God today. Come on. He said to James and John, you don't know what spirit you're of. See, so many people, we mix law and grace together and we don't realise that we're not living from a spirit of grace. Jesus wanted His disciples to live from a spirit of grace. When you live from grace, it releases the power of God into your life to change you and to change the world around you. It's not through the judgment of God. It's not through the wrath of God, but it is through the grace, the power of God's grace that transforms our life and transforms our world. Amen. So I want you to turn with me 
in your Bibles right now to Matthew chapter 7, verse 28. And while you're turning there, one of my favourite quotes is from a a famous theologian and his name was A.W. Tozer. You may have heard of him. And one of my favourite quotes is from him because he said, what you think about God is the most important thing about you. What you think about God is the most important thing about you. Do you know that is so true? If I think, if I believe that God isn't truly good, if I believe that it's God's grace, but then a little bit of me, that it's God's grace, but then also there's, there's judgment and, and, and God's happy with me one day and then not happy with me the next day. If I believe God is like that, that will determine the way I relate to God. That will determine the way I relate to myself. That will shape my identity and it will determine the way I then relate to people, right? See, if I tr- but then if I believe the new covenant of grace, if I truly believe and understand and receive a revelation of the finished work of the cross, that God is eternally good and gracious and more merciful than we'll ever understand, that He's always eternally happy with me, amen? If I believe that, that will shift my whole life. What I think about God is the most important thing about me. That will shape my identity and that will shift the way I see the world, even right now. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 28, are you there? This is a great passage. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at His teaching. So Jesus has, He's on, the, he's on a mountain And there's a whole crowd around him. And this is the famous Sermon on the Mount, right? One of the greatest sermons ever preached by Jesus. And he's on this mountain, he's teaching the people. And this is, uh, this passage is straight after that. He's finished, they were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. If you want to preach law today, you will not walk in God's authority. Come on, come on. It is through grace that the authority of the Lord is released upon the earth. That's a good point. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, when Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed Him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before Him and said, Lord, if You are willing, You can make me clean. Jesus reached out His hand and touched the man. I am willing, He said, Be clean. Did you hear that? I am willing, Jesus said. Be clean. Immediately, immediately the man was cleansed, completely healed, completely transformed of his leprosy. And I'm sure he had a whole paradigm shift on the grace of God. This is a really interesting passage. Uh, Firstly, on on a smaller scale on this man with leprosy, and then on a greater scale of Jesus being up the mountain and coming down. Remember where the law was given to Moses. It was given on top of a mountain, but God stayed up the mountain and Moses came down and gave it to the people. Really interesting. Jesus is on a mountain and He comes down. The leper throughout all of, uh, throughout the whole covenant, it was taught that the leper was unclean. So if you look at Leviticus chapter 13, it talks about the regulations for the leper. And the leper, leprosy was a, was a, a skin issue, a skin disease. And the, if someone had leprosy, they'd go to the priest and the priest would check it out. Uh, if they had open raw flesh, the priest would pronounce them as unclean, right? And then the leper had to uh, be, uh, not join the community uh, the leper had to stay outside. It was, a, it was really a life of shame that the leper could, and the leper could not get free from leprosy on their own. And it was actually believed, you know, in, in Hebrew culture, if you remember the story of, of Moses, oh sorry, yeah, of Moses, Aaron and Miriam. And remember when Miriam and Aaron rebelled against Moses and what happened to Miriam is she got leprosy, Right because of her sin of rebellion to Moses, their leader under the old covenant. And so it was believed in Jewish history that, uh, in Jewish culture, that if you had leprosy, 
you, you didn't just have leprosy. It wasn't just, a, uh, it, just, it just came bad luck. It was because you were a sinner. That was one of the beliefs. You had leprosy because you live a lifestyle of sin and it's your fault you had leprosy. And so the leper, you could imagine their view of themselves, their view of, a, of, of religion and their view of God. They believe that they were an outcast. God did not love me. God could not love me. I'm stuck in sin. There is no help. I'm stuck in a life of shame. And this leper, that is why he's at the bottom of the mountain. He cannot go up. He's not allowed to go up that mountain. I wonder what he's thinking about God and about God's grace. I wonder what he's thinking about God. And the most powerful statement in this passage is it says in Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, that when Jesus was teaching the Sermon on the Mount, you know, you can't fulfil the Sermon on the Mount. You can't live in any of that unless you're empowered by the Spirit of God and living in God's grace. Because Jesus, He, he heightened the law to, to a greater level. He said, if you even lust after a woman, you're committing adultery in your, in your heart, right? You cannot fulfil the Sermon on the Mount without living in the new covenant power of God's grace and by the Spirit of God. Come on. And Jesus, the most powerful uh, statement in this passage is it says, Jesus came down the mountain. Come on. Jesus has come down the mountain today, church. The King, I want you to get this statement into you. The King has come down the mountain. It says in Scripture in John chapter 1, verse 17, that the law was given through Moses, right? God gave the law to Moses. Moses came down and gave it to the nation. The law was given through Moses, but, but listen to this, grace and truth has come through Jesus Christ, through the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Grace and truth has come down the mountain to transform lives today. The leper had no ability to get free on his own and he's wondering, how will I ever live a life for God? How will I ever please God? The leper cannot get free on his own, but grace and truth, Jesus Christ has come down the mountain and He touches the leper and the power of sin is completely destroyed in the leper's life and he is healed. Come on, that's why it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, we're getting on a roll now. In Romans chapter 5, verse 20, it says, where sin increases, grace increases all the more. So if you see sin anywhere in your life, if you see sin anywhere in the world, God's judgment does not increase. Are you listening? If you're stuck in negative behaviour today or if you're feeling like you can't measure up to God like this leper or, or you can't live for God or you just need to be a better person, it's not God's judgment that increases in your life. Where sin increases, where disobedience increases, it is God's grace that increases all the more. Come on, that is the incredible goodness of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Some people today need to change the way you think about God. So the leper, he is completely healed and transformed and restored into society. It is a picture of the two covenants, the covenant of law and the covenant of grace. Grace has come down the mountain, grace and truth. You notice that their, their, their concepts are connected. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth Grace and truth came, it was came, came, came into humanity. God entered into humanity, came through Jesus Christ. Amen. Whew. I pray that you're getting this today. Grace empowers inside out transformation. Grace empowers inside out transformation. The law focuses on your behaviour but grace focuses on your believing. The law focuses on right behaviour. To the leper, it says, you've just got to be better and better and better. But grace focuses on right believing. There are two stories in Scripture which are really profound in the way that Jesus relates to two certain men. There are two rich people that Jesus approaches in the Gospels. One is in Mark chapter 10. And, and listen to this, this is really powerful. In Mark chapter 10, you have the rich young ruler. And he comes to Jesus and he says, 
Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So he, he wants to live for God. He's got a genuine heart, apparently. And Jesus, He doesn't show the man grace, which is really interesting. He doesn't preach grace to this man, but this man is self-righteous. He's thinking, God, what do I have to do, right? So Jesus wants to take him to the end of himself so that he realises he needs a Saviour. Do you know that's what the law does? In Romans chapter 7, verse 7, Paul talks about the law and he says, the law is good in that I wouldn't not have known what sin was unless it was for the law, right? The law pointed sin out within me, but the law was not the end. It was our guardian until Christ came. The law points you to your need for, your, for a Saviour. The law cannot save you. The law is meant to tell you, right? The commandments, the, 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 all throughout Scripture, it tells you that you need Jesus. Come on, you need Jesus to live for God, right? And so Jesus says to this rich young ruler, well, you know the law, you shouldn't steal, don't commit adultery, don't murder, do all these things. And the rich young ruler says, I, I've done this from my youth. I've been this good. I've been an amazing person. I've been a good person. And Jesus says, there's one thing you lack. Go sell everything you have. Give it all to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven and follow me. Wow. There, it says in the Scripture that the rich young ruler, he was saddened in his heart because outwardly he had amazing behaviour, but inwardly, Inwardly, there was no change. Inwardly, he had a heart of greed and of selfishness. And so he went away saddened, not changed at all after speaking to Jesus. Now, listen to this. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus also encounters a rich man. Look at how Jesus treated this rich young ruler but then look at this rich man that he approaches in Luke chapter 19 named Zacchaeus, the tax collector. He was a rich man, but he was a sinner. Zacchaeus was seen as a sinner in the nation of Israel. And so Jesus uh, is walking along the road and Zacchaeus is up in a tree looking for Jesus. And Jesus doesn't preach the law to Zacchaeus. Come on. Jesus doesn't treat Zacchaeus as he does a young ruler. Why? because Zacchaeus realises that he is a sinner. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, tonight I'm dining at your place. And all the religious Pharisees of the day, they're thinking, oh, Jesus is having dinner. He, he's he's socialising with a sinner. He's socialising with, 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 with the bad people in town. He's socialising with the people that don't live for God, that are living a rebellious lifestyle. How often, how often can we be judgmental like that? Anyway. And Zacchaeus, what happens is there is a whole transformation in his life, all because Jesus showed Zacchaeus the grace of God. If Jesus preached law to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus never would have changed. But it says in the passage that Zacchaeus said to Jesus, he encountered the grace of Jesus in his life. And Zacchaeus said to Jesus, Lord, if, if, I, if I give half my possessions to the poor right now. That's what Zacchaeus said. He was a rich man. He says, I give half my possessions to the poor. That's a lot of money. And if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will repay them back four times over. Come on, that is grace. When you encounter the true grace of God, you are completely transformed from the inside out. Grace brings inside out transformation in our lives. It shifts the whole way we think about God. And Zacchaeus was completely transformed. Jesus says to Jesus pronounces, hallelujah, salvation has come to this household and to Zacchaeus' life. Come on, see, salvation always follows the grace of God. Whenever you are living in grace, you will always see the saving power and delivering power and the miracle working power of God in your life. It is all unmerited, unearned, undeserved favour and blessing of God. Amen. Whew. That is God's grace. So Jesus came down the mountain for the leper. Amen. And it's a picture of the covenant of grace in our life. That Jesus, when we place our faith in Jesus, I want you to think about this. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, not he's a new creation and an old creation, an old creation altogether, and an old man, a new man living within me. No. It says, if any man be in Christ, he is or she is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen. That scripture shows us what has happened in the new covenant is when you place your faith in Jesus, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Ghost comes into your spirit and makes you a brand new creation. Friend, today you are brand new. You have new creation life on the inside of you today. Amen. That is all by God's grace. So He comes within us and He transforms us from the inside out. Grace is an inside out work. Law was outside in. And if I'm always thinking outside in, it's a good idea. It's a good point. It's a good indicator for me that I'm living out of performance based Christianity. Right? Grace has transformed your spirit man. And then what is in your spirit, man, the new creation life in you, God wants that to flow into your soul and into your body and into your world today. Amen. That's why it says in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, it's talking about the new covenant. It's all about what God will do. And it says that I will place my spirit in you. I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit. Amen. That's what we have received. And it says, I will remove, listen to this, really important. I will remove your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. What was the old covenant written upon? The finger of God wrote upon stone tablets. And it says here, Ezekiel says, when he's prophesying about the new covenant that we're living in, I will remove your heart of stone. I will remove that. And I will give you a heart of flesh. And in Hebrews, it talks about the same passage. uh, And and the writer of Hebrews says that it's it's God has now written His laws. He's written His, His commandments upon our heart. The finger of God has now written upon our new spirit man. And we obey God from the inside out. Amen. He's removed the law and He's replaced it with His spirit man of grace. Come on. I remember... When I was in Bible college, there was great teaching, but I remember one time and hearing about this and, and I, don't, I don't know how much this flows throughout all of Christianity, but I know I certainly believe this before I understood the new covenant of grace. And uh, I was listening to a teacher one time in Bible college and, and they were talking about how we, under, we, we now have a, a, a new nature, and a sin nature. So you are righteous and you are a sinner at the same time. This is what a lot of people can believe. I'm going to free people from this today. The revelation of grace is going to free you from this today, whoever is listening online. A lot of people believe that we have a sin nature and that we have a righteous nature, that through the cross that, yes, Jesus brought new creation life into us, but there is this war within us, right? And, and, it's, and it's, uh, there's this, the war of sin and the war of, of grace in our life, the new man and the old man within us, right? And it's, and it's within you and, and it's, it's whoever you feed that will be victorious, right? And, and, and you know what? It's all rubbish. Paul, they quote Paul in Romans 7, but Paul is talking about his life before Jesus, Paul is saying the things I wanted to do, I couldn't do. Why? Because he wasn't empowered by grace. He was under law. Amen. And so this, I remember hearing this and I'm thinking that that does not free people. And that is not the revelation of the new covenant of grace. If you tell someone you have a sin nature, and if you truly believe that, how will you ever be free to reign in life through the one man, Christ Jesus? Come on, let's not devalue the work of Jesus on the cross. Let's not devalue the power of the cross, of the new creation life within us, that if any man be in Christ, he is a brand new creation. You are brand new today. There is no war of sin and of grace, of the sin nature and righteous nature within you. When God sees you, He pronounces you righteous and holy. He pronounces you as born again. He doesn't relate to you out of your sin. He relates to you out of your new identity in Jesus Christ today. Come on, let that free some people today. Amen. 
In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says this, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For the Gospel, listen to this, for in the Gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Do you get that? The power of the Gospel of grace is that it reveals that you, when you place your faith in Jesus, you are righteous. You are eternally righteous. You are a brand new creation. That is the power of the Gospel of grace. It's the power of God unto salvation. Amen. It's the saving power of God that comes within you. And He transforms you from the inside out. Grace brings inside out transformation. I was talking to someone about this just two months ago and their lifestyle was steeped in religion and they didn't have really have a relationship with God, but they had been exposed to a good dose, a very healthy dose of religion in their life, of law, right? And I was talking to them about this about the Gospel and, they, they, and so they believed, the, but they said, yeah, I know that Jesus did this, but, but I'm still stuck in sin. And, and they didn't realise, they'd never realised what the Gospel actually saved them from. The Gospel saves you from sin and the devil. Come on, that is the power of the Gospel. There is power in the blood of Jesus. Let's not devalue that. And as I was talking to them about the Gospel of grace, and of the new creation life in Jesus and of righteousness, it completely transformed their whole thinking about God and their whole way of life. This person was completely changed in a moment, all because they encountered the incredible grace of God. Amen, the transforming power of God's grace. Church, let's be a church that preaches grace. Let's be a church that doesn't preach law and grace together, that doesn't mix law and grace. Let's be a church that fully preaches the incredible grace of God, the new covenant grace of God, amen. There's this story in John chapter eight, and there is a woman that comes to Jesus caught in adultery. And I wanna show you really quickly before we finish, I wanna show you what grace has given us so that we can reign in life. This woman comes to Jesus and the, the Pharisees have set it all up so that Jesus is teaching and they, they catch this woman in adultery. They take her to Jesus because they know that under the law, she deserves death. She deserves judgment under the law, right? And Jesus knows their hearts. And so Jesus says to them, well, he says, you're bringing this woman to me. They say, they say teacher, uh, this woman's been caught in the act of adultery. She deserves to be stoned. What do you say? And Jesus says, well, you're preaching the law. Well, let's take it up a level. Jesus says, if there is anyone without sin here, let them cast the first stone. Because Jesus knew the only person without sin was Him. Remember, He's heightening the law. If you even lust after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery. I can guarantee you that those Pharisees had done that in their life. And the Pharisees get the picture. And so it says in this Scripture that one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they all leave and only Jesus is left. Who knows that the only person who has the right to condemn and judge this woman caught in the act of adultery is Jesus. I wonder what she's thinking. I wonder what she's thinking about the grace of God. She's probably thinking, I deserve God's judgment. I know, God's, I know the law, I deserve to be judged. And Jesus says to the woman, woman, who is left to accuse you? And she looks up and she says, no one, my Lord. And Jesus doesn't say, well, I accuse you, I condemn you. You shouldn't have done this, you shouldn't have done that. You've just got to, live. come on. Why did you do this? Why don't you live? Don't you realise how much I love you? Why don't you just live better? That is so often how we relate to how we think what God is saying, what we think God's saying over our lives, right? That's often how we can relate to God. God, I've just got to be better. I've got this behaviour or this mess in my life and I've just got to live better for you. I've just got to pray more. I've just got to read my Bible more. I've just got to do this more. No, no, 
You need to receive God's grace, friend. Jesus says to the woman, then neither do I condemn you. The most powerful, one of some of the most powerful words in Scripture. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Come on, go now and leave your life of sin. He didn't say, leave your life of sin and I won't condemn you. It was the gift of no condemnation under grace that Jesus gave to the woman that then empowered her to get free from sin, to live a life free from sin. Jesus wouldn't have said, leave your life of sin, if he, don't live in sin, if He didn't think it was possible under grace. Come on, He gives her grace and it is the power of grace that transforms this woman's life and she's able to live a life free from sin, free from addiction, free from unbelief and realising the incredible goodness of God. Come on, my friends, it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. We don't repent. So, so many of us can have it backwards. So many people think right now, I know there are people listening and you think that you just need to, it, repent and get your life better and then God will bless you and then God will love you and then God will care for you and then you'll see victory in your finances or in your health or in your inner world. That is the wrong way around. It is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Come on, under the new covenant, God has lavished His grace upon you, His kindness upon you first, His mercy upon you first, His goodness upon you first. And when you see that, when you see the beauty and the glory and the incredible goodness of Jesus, that is what leads you to repentance. It is when our world sees the goodness of God it is when your friend sees the goodness of God and they're stuck in addiction or sin or, or they're so far from God. It's when they see His goodness and beauty first, the power and love of our Saviour. That is what leads us to change in our heart and in our mind, amen. So this woman, she received the gift of no condemnation and under grace, that is the gift that God gives. He gives us the gift of no condemnation. Condemnation is saying that you have to pay the debt for what you've done. And condemnation is the root of a lot of pain and a lot of issues in the lives of non-believers and believers. Condemnation produces guilt and guilt produces shame. Condemnation is you've done something wrong, I've sinned towards God or someone else, I have to punish myself for it. It brings self-hatred. It, it brings a, a disconnection in your relationship with God. And it says, so it, it produces guilt in our life, right? I feel bad. And I know many Christians today are living under a cloud of guilt from your past. You're living under a cloud of guilt of maybe you're in an addiction that you're stuck in right now. And so we feel bad about ourselves for long enough we, we, need to, we feel the need, we justify punishing ourselves rather than realising what Jesus has done on the cross. And then that guilt says, I've done something wrong. It leads to shame and shame tells us that I am wrong. There is something wrong with me. And there are many believers stuck in, under condemnation which produces guilt and shame in their life. I've done something wrong. I am wrong. They're, God, you must have created me the wrong way. God, just choose someone else for the mission because I can't do it. It is the gift of no condemnation that sets us free. I remember I used to have this issue uh, in my thinking and in my relationship with God, especially to do with prayer. I really wanted to develop my prayer life with God. And so I, uh, I, was, I was trying to pray more and, and the Bible says, you know, also pray for people and lay hands on the sick and see them recover, right? And so... I thought, I just want to live more. I, I want to be more obedient to you, God. But every time I came into prayer, I would feel this weight of condemnation because I knew that there were behaviours in my life that probably weren't right. And so I, I was like, well, I, I spent 15 minutes, 20 minutes in prayer first before I even got to praying or, or speaking to God, just repenting of everything and saying, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Not realising that it's the law that points you to yourself. Grace points you to Jesus. And when you see Jesus, you see yourself. Come on, that's a revelation for someone today. 
And so I would get up, get up in the morning and I'd go throughout my day and I'd see a, someone or maybe a family member who was sick and I'd wanna pray for them. Or maybe I, I would go and pray for them. But there was always incredible doubt and fear in my heart because I didn't truly believe I was worthy to pray for them. Why would God move through someone like me? That is what I thought. And that is where many people are at today. I'm here to tell you today that you are living under a cloud of condemnation. And you need to receive the Lord's gift of no condemnation today under the new covenant today. When I began to learn the finished work of the cross, when I received the revelation of grace, it then empowered me to reign in life. It then empowered me to come to God and knowing that it's only in the presence of God that I can truly get free from sin. And when I understood grace, I was able to commune with God so much better, understand His goodness and His heart towards me, understand my new identity in Christ. And that completely freed me from every sin and wrong behaviour in my life. Come on, you've got it the wrong way around today, church. Come on, it's the gift of no condemnation. Let that cloud of condemnation come off your life today. Amen. I want to read this Scripture to you. It says here in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Did you get that? All, all, every sin, past, present, future has been forgiven by God. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness. Did you get that? So, so there was a legal indebtedness towards you. That is condemnation. You were condemned because your sin meant that you had a legal indebtedness to God. But Jesus on the cross has cancelled that. Stop paying the price for what Jesus has already paid the price for. Whew. Jesus has taken it away. So this legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, He's taken it away, nailing it to the cross and having disarmed the powers and authorities. Listen to this. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Amen. Every sin was nailed to the cross. It wasn't a partially completed work. Everything, everything of who you were, Jesus took on the cross. He paid the debt for it. You don't owe God anything anymore. Stop condemning yourself. Stop punishing yourself. You know, you will only keep yourself in a lifestyle of addiction or fear or unbelief if you live in condemnation, which brings guilt and shame. Be freed today by the revelation of the gift of no condemnation. Stop. See, when we punish ourselves, what we are saying is that we're really saying to God that what you did through Jesus wasn't enough for me. We're devaluing the power of the blood of Jesus. And so in Colossians here, it talks about that Jesus disarmed the powers and principalities. What are the powers and principalities? Well, that was the devil. And what did the devil use? The devil is his name, right? is in, all throughout Scripture, His name is the accuser. I want you to think about this as we close. The accuser. The accuser in Greek, that is a legal term. Do you know what the devil is really good at and he's not good at anything else? He's only good at this. He is really good at accusing you and pointing you to the law. The devil will always use the law to accuse people. You're not good enough. You didn't pray enough. You know, if... If, uh, if you read your Bible for 20 minutes today, you've, you didn't read it for 40 minutes. There's someone, there's another pastor who, who is reading it a lot longer than you or, you know, you, you prayed for one sick person today. Well, no, no, you didn't pray for two though. That is the work of the devil. The devil is the master accuser. It's all he's good at. He accuses God's people. And if you walk in condemnation today, the devil will, he will, he will, uh, it's not playing games here. The devil will keep you in it. He'll keep you stuck in sin and unbelief because he is the master accuser and he'll keep playing with your mind and with your life. And so the power of this scripture is it says that Jesus disarmed, he disarmed the devil and we now live in the triumph of Jesus because the devil cannot accuse us anymore when we live under grace. Stop letting him accuse you today. Grace is God's greatest weapon against the devil. Come on.
Amen. Grace is God's greatest weapon in our life against the devil. Amen. Receive His grace today, church. Receive His grace and His gift of no condemnation. The Hebrew word for grace, one of the Hebrew words is the word uh, hayen. So it's spelt H-H-E-N. And it means to pitch a tent under God's, under God's tender, loving mercy and kindness. That is one of the Hebrew words for grace. It is beautiful. It means to pitch a tent under God's tender, loving mercy and kindness. Amen. It's interesting that all throughout Scripture, uh, there are two mountains that God's people pitch their tents at. There are two mountains that God's people live at. There was Mount Sinai and there is Mount Zion, which the Apostle Paul describes for us is now a spiritual mountain. Mount Sinai was where the law of Moses was given and it was the covenant of law and judgment and condemnation given to people. Mount Zion is the new covenant in Christ. It's where the new believer is meant to, it lives. We've come to Mount Zion, Paul says in Hebrews 12. We haven't come to Mount Zion where there was fear and trembling and death and condemnation, but we pitch our tent, listen, we pitch our tent at Mount Zion, amen? At Mount Zion, the church of the firstborn with thousands and thousands of angels in worship with the grace of God, where the blessing of God flows. That is where we pitch our tent as new covenant believers today. Come on, under the law of Moses, see under the ministry of Moses, the first miracle was turning water into blood and that produced death throughout Egypt. No one could drink the water, it produced death. That is what happens when we believe, when we pitch our tent under the law. It produces death in our inner world and in our life. But under grace, under the ministry of Jesus, what was the first miracle of Jesus? It was in John 2, He turned the water not into blood, but He turned the water into wine, amen, which is a picture of joy, which is a picture of the anointing and a picture of God's blessing. Come on, Jesus didn't bring judgment. Jesus brought blessing today, church. We are to pitch our mindset, amen. We are to pitch our life under the incredible grace and mercy of God at Mount Zion. Come on today. Woo! That's where I needed everyone in the room to give me a big cheer. Come on. Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For in Christ Jesus, we've been set free from the, from the spirit of law and death, from, the spirit, from sin and death. And we now live alive to Christ. We now live alive to God under grace. Amen. I wanna encourage you today. What you think about God is the most important thing about you. Begin to pitch your mindset under grace today. Pitch your mindset at Mount Zion under the ministry of Jesus. Don't live in a mixture. Don't live at Mount Sinai. Don't live in the wilderness between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion in a mixture of law and grace. Pitch your tent, pitch your life under grace today, church. Amen. So as we close today, let me pray for people right now. And I'm believing that as I pray for people that that revelation is gonna flow into your life. And there's people today and you, there's areas in your life where you want freedom. There's areas where you wanna reign in life, but you're struggling to. And you're thinking, Lord, I just can't get free here or I just don't have boldness here or I'm just not walking in your blessing here. And I'm gonna pray today that the revelation of grace, this revelation, will flood through your heart and that you'll begin to realise that it's all through receiving God's grace, inside out transformation. I thank You, Lord. I thank You for Your incredible grace, Father. And I declare today the blessing and the favour and the incredible goodness of God over people's lives today. In Jesus' mighty Name, for those people who are living under condemnation or living in shame or living in fear or unbelief today or in addiction, I declare freedom over your life through the revelation of Christ crucified and resurrected, the new covenant in Jesus' mighty Name. Lord, I thank You, Father, for Your revelation of grace 
flooding people's hearts today in Jesus' Name. Cause us, Lord, to see our world, to see ourselves in a whole new paradigm of Your grace in Jesus' Name. Lord, we're in a time of chaos. I ask, Father, upgrade our way of thinking to think according to Your grace, to think according to the power of the blood of Jesus in this hour. In Jesus' Name I ask, Father, And I thank You, Holy Spirit, for those who need a miracle today. I declare that your life is being flooded with the incredible grace of God today. In Jesus' mighty Name, Amen, Amen. Well, have a blessed week this week, church, and walk in the power of God's grace. We'll see you next time.